Give to the World Ministries welcomes you to another teaching by Ralphina Dotson. Ralphina Dotson is well qualified to share the message you're about to hear as she lives the principles she teaches daily. As you listen, we trust this message will encourage you, help you grow and develop into maturity as a believer in the kingdom of God. The word you don't know is the word that cannot help you, and the word that doesn't take root can never bring a harvest. Let this message take root in the ground of your heart as you listen to it over and over and take notes. Receive this message. Receive your harvest. Hey, it's Ralph Fina. Um, I'm just glad we get to finish up. Uh, we started um, on a road, and I just want to take you exactly where we need to go. We don't get much time, uh, but we, well, the time we have, we are grateful for it. So thank you for watching and for being a part of uh, this program. But listen, we started off talking about how in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, it says, for I give you the keys. That means there is something that unlocks, unlocks the door, the, the gate, the barrier, the wall, the, the safe, the whatever is the riches are in, uh, the, there's a key to it. He says, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So if we want to know how to get there and what, how to make it work for us, we, we, we realize that there, is, there are keys that God has given us. <clears throat> it says, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So God wants you to have the understanding on how to cause heaven to come to you, and you are, are available, available to you is the keys to figure it out. And what I've come to a conclusion, and one of the keys is the compassion and love we have for one another. We need to care about each other. We need to see the value in each other. We need to understand that everybody's made in their own image of their time and their circumstance. There, there's a, a, a plan that if we could figure out where people start, we could figure out how they got where they are. Some people, their, 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 their bloodline is just in a bad shape. And so we talk about bloodline curses, where people got something from their father, and the, the grandfather, and the great-grandfather. Well, there, there's bloodline blessings. You got something good from your father, good from your grandfather. You got something good from your great-grandfather. And God wants us to have the key so that we can unlock the good things and draw the good things and lay hold to the good things. And so I was talking to you about how when something is wrong, we could see how we could be the reason it gets fixed. Oh, we talked about the shortfall, how it's necessary. For somebody to see the need, I'm trying to get across the bridge, you trying to get, you see me trying to get about the bridge, and I can't quite get there. Well, if I can extend a pole or something to you where you could make a way to get all the way over, then I'm, I'm fixing your shortfall. I find, a, I, I think I told you about the goat uh, that, was, that fell in the well and how it just shook off all the dirt that they poured on top of it, and, 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 and as it shook off the dirt, it pounded it under its feet, and that dirt finally rose to the point where it was so much dirt and he pounded it under his feet so much that he was able to crawl and walk out of that well. That's what God wants you to use, everything that comes your way so that you can help someone get where they couldn't go by themselves. Listen to this. If you find an error, correct it. Now, I know it's a lot of folks enjoy correcting other people's stuff, but they don't want nobody correcting their stuff. They're usually so sensitive, they can't let nobody correct nothing of theirs. But they'll find your stuff and bring it up to you and tell you, well, don't get sensitive about people like that. People like that are nervous and they don't feel good about themselves. And, and, and they like the f fact that they're right and they know stuff and they want people to know they know. I know a lot of people that, that correct you all the time, correct you, correct you. I get corrected all the time, all the time. People, somebody says, well, no, you said this. Well, I'm sorry. It, that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say so-and-so. Uh, a lot of times people want to say, you're dumb. You, you said the wrong thing. Well, maybe, maybe you are dumb and you don't know. Well, that's good to get the information. So now you can say you do know. But sometimes you know and you just speak so fast and something gets crossed and it comes out different or somebody didn't hear it right or something. But when you find an error, 
It's good to correct it, especially if you want someone else to look good. I've written several books, and, and one of the things I do is I find people, and I ask them that I think have skill and knowledge. Uh, I ask them to read the book and make corrections. Find the trouble with it so that when I put it out, somebody will see that it has value and it's articulately and excellently done so that it will not be discredited because of my sh shortcomings. Because when you're trying to do something, usually you have to read it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again just to find the fault because you're looking for what you know is there and you don't even read what's there. And so when you find an error, correct it. I remember I took a lady with me. <laughs> to, I was preaching up in Minnesota years ago. And after the service was over, a lady walked up to me. She said, oh, that was such a wonderful program. She says, but you know that, that lace that's hanging down under your dress? I said, the what? She said, that lace from your slip, it's, it's hanging down all the way to the floor. You didn't know that? I said, no. Well, I had taken a woman with me to help me. And she's sitting there. And I said to her, I said, did you know that my slip lace had torn and was hanging down? Oh, yes, I did. I said, well, why didn't you let me know? Oh, I didn't think uh, you wanted me to say anything in front of the people. I thought the people are looking at it the whole time I'm preaching. What good are you? What good, what good are we to God if we're not willing to help someone present their best? Present their best. Success. Applaud it. How come we don't want to applaud other people's good, other people's great? Oh, that was great, great, great. I got a little great grandbaby. Every time she gets something right, oh, we just clap and we clap. Oh, she feels so good. She gets to clap and everybody's clapping with her. Oh, we clap and we clap. How come we can't do that for each other? How come we can't be happy for each other? How come we can't applaud someone's success? Someone striving that finally gets them to a place where they feel like they're good. Because it may be very short-lived. And unless the people have some place where they felt good about themselves and seen something come to a place where it looks like they've succeeded, they would have no interest in continuing. You think about the hopelessness that comes over people that come to the conclusion that suicide is the only way they can get any peace. Suicide because they feel hopeless. But if you, we could find a way to just make the smallest thing something big. Now, I'm not all for the, the theory that everybody deserves a trophy. I'm not for that, because I think if you give trophies to everybody, there's no incentive for improvement and no willingness to succumb to uh, the need for the team to get to a place where you get where you're supposed to go or no willing for you to get to the, the place where you're supposed to stretch yourself to get where you're supposed to go. You, that, that becomes a goal for you, the trophy. Oh, but now we've gotten so sad and so sensitive. Everybody gets a trophy. Well, everybody don't deserve a trophy, but we do it when we're children. But when we get grown, the problem with that is when they get, people get grown, they think, well, I didn't get no trophy. Well, no, you left the jar open. You left the the door open, you, I mean, what, 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 what you could have done, you didn't do. What you could have done, you didn't do. And until you do what you can do, you don't get the trophy. You don't get the, does that make sense? I hope it does. And when you have someone have an achievement, there should be a reward. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I've improved the most. I've, I've been, been there the longest. I was at a church service one time and they said, who is the oldest person in the church? And finally, this man raised his hand, and they said, oh, brother so-and-so, how old are you? He said, 114. <laughs> I thought, oh, oh, God, he shouldn't have to put his feet on the floor no more. Everybody should carry him around. He has achieved a tremendous achievement to survive life 114 years. I couldn't keep my eyes off him from that minute on. 114, that's what he said. And I thought, that's an achievement. We need to make something big out of this. We need to feed him and dress him and do stuff and clean up for him and, and, and I mean, do whatever we can do for him. Reward him in some kind of way for making life livable for himself and probably others along the way, 114 years. If we could figure out how when there's a wound, treat it. 
We can do this, all these things I'm telling you you can do, you can do it with words. Words that heal and deliver and soothe and touch and a wound. People are wounded people. They've been hurt by rejection. They felt like somebody didn't love them. People abandoned them, you know. I, I, I look around, and I'll be straight with you. This is just me. I know that when I see someone that's really, really heavy, I feel like they have been, been do, endured much misery, and they've been wounded over and over, and they find food to be one sweet, loving place that they can go, and they don't have to share it, and they can just enjoy it and feel good for the moment, but it, it, it comes with a cost. So if we can help people find a way to touch a wound and heal it, Oh, people have been abused and raped and maligned and mis abandoned and mistreated. Just, just, just say something loving. Tell them you care about them and love them. Say something funny so they can laugh. We can heal people's wounds with our kindness and with our words. That's just the truth. Hallelujah. We, 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 we can have happiness and we can have hope. And we can, we can share it. We can share it. We can figure a way to share it. When there's doubt, we need to bring something about so, so people can develop some faith. Because the difference from faith is, is doubt. It's, it's like you don't believe. You, can, you can't relax. You don't believe it's going to come out that way. We can help people with that. When people get offended, and I know it's easy to get offended, Offenses happen every day, so somebody has the ability to offend someone every single day. But we just have to learn how to forgive. Can you let the person off the hook? You, we got people lassoed and harnessed into an act or a word or a deed, or, uh, and we don't let them off. We let them have, they have to live there forever with us. And we want to drag them around with us. And, and, and people, sometimes they forget, and they're not even aware of what they've said or done. You dragging them around in your mind. They've gone on about their business. They don't even realize you are offended. And whenever people realize they have offended you and hurt you, usually it offends them and hurts them in the long run, and they'll come back. I've had many people come back and say, well, I'm sorry I love you. I'm sorry I care about you. I'm sorry. And you need to be willing to do that too. When you know you've hurt someone, when you know you said something wrong to someone, you need to be willing to go back and say, listen, I made a mistake. That was the wrong thing for me to say. I was upset. I didn't respond right. I, I assumed something. I thought this was true and it's not. And I found out I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That's not such a bad thing to have to do. How come we're not willing to do that? How come we don't see the value in apologizing and saying, I'm, I'm so sorry this hurt you and wounded you? Can you please forgive me? It was not my desire to cause you pain. I, I've seen the stories about people being incarcerated, uh, uh, innocent people being incarcerated for years and years and years and years. And nobody wants to apologize to them. Nobody wants to say, I'm sorry we did this to you. But then there's someone who always seems to be able to say, that happened to you and that's the worst thing and I'm so sorry that happened. It's hard to forgive, and, but if we can trust God, he'll allow forgiveness to flow in us. He'll give us the strength to forgive. And when we forgive, we cut the tie to that and them, and we can go forward free and loose. And Oh, so many things we could do, and we could do this with words. You can speak it out of love for the need to, to show people the love of God. I'm talking about showing people God's love. Transgressions, when we've done things the wrong way, when we've handled things badly, we've done something to somebody, we need to repent. We need to go to God and say, I'm so sorry, Lord. And then we need to go to the person and say, I'm so sorry. See, what you have to understand is, if we speak and teach using healing words, we are the only hope the world has. They got to see how to do it. They cut each other's throats so easily and they go on about their business and they pretend like it's not there, but it makes a person harder. 
and, and steals their peace and their comfort and their freedom to be around other people because of the many times they've gotten stabbed and wounded and hurt. Oh, gosh. I think about how evil is admired and uh, humor is profane and horror is pursued and craved. Demons are a sign to keep us in a place where we do not and we do not look like God, do not look like God's word. A hundred years ago, I wrote this down and I wanted to say it. A hundred years ago, the church, so in 1920, a hundred years ago, the church was the center of the society. Hmm. Now this man said this a hundred years ago. And really, he said it 200 years ago because this writing was written 100 years ago. So 200 years ago, the church was the center of society. That's in 1820, the church, okay? The present is the lead, and the, and the priest or the person sitting in the presiding seat is the leader of the culture 200 years ago, the priest. Now, now the entertainer is the priest. The entertainer is the priest. And the stage is the church. We've got to change, guys. We don't have long to cause people's eyes to open. I want you to have an attitude that God is, wants to use you. The Bible says that we are ministers of reconciliation. Bring people back to a godliness, a kindness, a caringness, a sensitivity, a concern. So we're going to say a prayer. I want us to say a prayer together because I want you to just see yourself as somebody that God needs. I want you to see yourself as God, someone God has a plan for, some place. He says, I have a plan for you, a plan for your good and not for evil. God wants you to understand that we are the transformation agents of the earth. We're the people that cause transformation. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we transform someone's mind by our renewing and sharing it with them with our words, our kindness, our example. There's an atmosphere around us that is, is, that is producing what we're putting out. We're putting out vulgar humor. We're putting out profanity. We're putting out nudity. We're putting out per perversion alternate lifestyles, you know, when I think about the sad people that are caught up in this thing, there's so many people that the only reason they're L, B, G, T, K, Z, X, Y, Z is because they were rejected or felt unloved. And they were looking for some place to go and be, some place to have someone around them, someone that would understand them. And they yielded to this temptation, this seemingly alluring thing that was so new and hip, things come out new, that's great. Oh gosh, I think about how every they make a remake a movie and when they make it over, it's so horrible and foul. Oh, Sleeping Beauty was such a sweet little movie when they first made it. But but uh Walt Disney's intention was the, to cause it to become something that the enemy could use. He was a sorcerer. He believed in sorcery. So here we are now, and when you see the the the, the, the sleeping, the sorcerer, the swordsman, and the, all the stories that used to be the innocent, fun stories, they all had a witch in them, all of them. And now the witch is looking like one, and we don't even understand how we got there. So the atmosphere, we're supposed to have atmospheric uh, productivity. We're supposed to change the atmosphere. We're supposed to cause the atmosphere in, 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 our, in, our, in our families, in our households, in our workplaces. I think about it, I went to, a, I had a little supposed grandchild at the time, I found out he really wasn't my grandchild, but I went to their house to, to try and love on him, and it was the day they were having his first birthday party. And I went there to give a little money, back in the day they used to give savings bonds. 
and I had a little $50 savings bond or something like that to give to the little baby. And when I walked in the room, all the people took their beers and their drinks and everything and slid them down behind the chair. I saw the people moving their drinks behind the chairs. I saw it. And I came in and I greeted everybody and I loved on the little baby and everything. And, 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 and I, I, when I left there, I thought, mm, the atmosphere in their place changed because I was there. And I'm thanking God, I'm thanking God, I'm thanking God that he has given me the ability to see how it is our responsibility to change the atmosphere. To cause people to have to honor God because we honor him. We have to have a cultural shift. We can't just live any kind of way or everything is about us. And we have a generation of young people that have been told that lie. It's all about me. I don't care how I affect anybody else. I have the right to be how I am. I'm, it's about me. My, me, my, and I. That's what we've taught. We've allowed that to prevail. We're trying to build self-esteem. That's not the way you build self-esteem. That's the way you cause a person to be in a state of error where all the things that their vulnerability is so deep that any horrible thing can come to them and they're not a defensive, able to defend themselves. They have no defense. They are not able to defend it. They become subject to it. Oh, we've allowed ourselves to almost become disqualified to represent the kingdom of God. And God needs us to come to a, 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 an awareness. Back to Ephesians. Turn there again. Ephesians, the first chapter. I'm going to read it one more time, the 15th verse. It says, 15th verse, chapter 1. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith. This is Paul teaching about the people there. He said, after I heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. That's what God wants. We need to have love for each other. Love for all the saints. Do not cease to give thanks for you. The angels are praising us, singing. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. The angels are singing for us. It says, all the saints do not cease to give thanks for you, Make it mention of you in my prayers. I've been to places and people have been so kind. I pray for them all the time. I think of them all the time. I call them all the time. I, I try to make connection with them. I try to remind them that I didn't forget how kind they were and how loving they were. And it says that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him how we can do what we are. Revelation on how he thinks, revelation on what, he, what he's predestined for us, what he's planned for us, what his intentions are for right now. That the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, be opened up bright so that we can see. Oh, I thank God. The eyes of our heart be open so that we can see. Oh, Boarding of the new inheritance of his riches. That's what we, we have to have. It says, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? The riches is, is that we find ourselves able to walk through life, being a support and a help to others, and as a result, they can be a support and help to others. And we just help each other as we go. That's what we call generational blessings. The bad news to the world is that we are the kingdom and, and we are the church and the church has not shown itself to be as kind as God wants us to be. So you have to understand something. We, there's no in-between place. Uh, I saw a movie the other night called Switzerland. There is no Switzerland here. It's either you are a part of the kingdom race or you're a part of the lost race. It's not, it's not an ethnic thing where you, where you come from, what your skin color is, what kind of hair you have, what you eat. It's the kingdom, the people that are, have access to the things of God, that's the race we are, the kingdom race, or we are the lost race. And the world needs us to shine so bright that they have a desire to be with us, be like us, and to imitate what we've done change others' lives. 
Oh, you can't kill a human being, especially one that's in, in, the, in the world. Um, they're going to live somewhere forever. <laughs> and you surely can't kill the ones that love the Lord. They're going to be in his presence forever. I want us to pray a prayer together so that we can think about who we are. I'm just going to pray it and you listen and be in agreement. Father, I thank you for creating me to house your spirit and to carry your anointing to tell the good news to the poor. I don't think they mean poor in pockets in your pockets, but just poor in spirit, poor in joy, poor in understanding of hope. According to God's word, I have sent, been sent to comfort. I've been sent to comfort the brothers and the brokenhearted. I will gladly tell the captives they are free and the prisoners that they are released. Isaiah chapter 61. Come on, listen. I will use my faith and my prayer for the sick. I don't want to see people just suffering. I will use my faith. I will use my faith. Well, you don't have faith for healing? I got faith for healing. I'm going to pray for you. For the sick, I will walk in humility and gratitude continually in my heart. Man, how do we get there? We just have to start doing things God's way. It'll come, it'll come easy. I will, live, I will live life as a living sacrifice. I'm what God made, and I, I, he, he sacrificed for me, so I'm going to sacrifice the life that I would have for the, in exchange for the life he's made available to me. And bring glory to your name, Father. I accept my ordination as a minister of reconciliation. As a minister of reconciliation for you, O oh God, I do so. In Jesus' mighty name. Man, I love it. Oh, thank you, Lord, for receiving us. We realize that this is the time where we need to shine for you. We need to step up and become what you planned for us to be. And we thank you. And we receive it done. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, we say amen. Amen. Oh, man. We say it all in agreement that settles it, and it is so. You guys have a good day. Love you. Bye-bye. <laughs>